I hear you want to make gin at home. Well, I've got some good news for you. This is the perfect video because I'm gonna take you through the whole process in step-by-step -step increments to get all the way from making a vodka wash to the distilling of the vodka, to the gin botanicals, and of course the gin distillation. Uh, and we're gonna come out with two different recipes in one video. A gin base recipe, the bare minimum ginny gin this, <laughs> so you can get used to how to make gin uh, and use this as a springboard to add your own flair, to dial in your own preferences and make a different gin, which is what I've done over here as well. How's it going, Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, this is Still It, and I am excited for this video. I've been planning on doing it for ages. This isn't gonna be some wussy little 15 minute video where we kind of dance around the idea and just kind of go from when we've already got vodka. We're going beginning to end, uh, and we're gonna go deep. We're gonna get stuck in, and you're gonna know pretty much everything you need to know to go and start making gin from scratch yourself at home. Let's get stuck in, shall we? The first thing we need to do is, of course, make a vodka wash, a vodka recipe. I made this vodka recipe special for this video. It's gonna give us a nice clean fermenting, clean tasting product at the end of the day, but it's gonna add in a little bit of grainy flair and some extra velvety smoothness as well to really make our gins sing. So here's what you're gonna need. You're gonna need three liters of water, there will be freedom units popping up all over the place, and of course, a recipe in the description down below, guys. Come on, you should know that by now. But uh, three liters of water in a pot, and to that, we're going to add that in freedom units, or 160 grams of wheat bran, along with 50 grams of oats. The wheat bran is gonna add a, a, a serially little bite to the end of the, the mouth pellet, uh, and also it gives a interesting kind of licorice-ness that I really like, and the oats are gonna give us that extra added smoothness. And that's actually gonna be kind of important for this video. You'll see why in a second. Anyway, uh, get them in there, get them all mixed up, and we're gonna boil those for 30 minutes. Now when the 30 minutes is up, you can take all of the stuff that was in the pot, tip it into your fermenter. You're gonna need about a 25 liter fermenter for this recipe. Let me jump in here real quick and say that uh, this is going to make 15 liters of wash, and two bottles of gin. The reason I'm doing that is because we're going to be working with a four liter still. The easiest way to figure out the volume of wash that will work best for you is to take the size of your still, the capacity of the still that you can actually, you know, the liquid you can actually safely fit in there and multiply that by three to four times and that's gonna give you the right volume. So a four liter still times three is 12, times four is 16. I'm going kind of in the middle-ish on the high side and aiming for 15 liters. If you're using a 50 liter still, you can safely fit 40 liters into that. It's gonna be 10 times the size. So just multiply everything by 10 in the recipe down below. And add in three kilograms of sugar. Give it a really good stir, get it nice and dissolved. And then you can go about adding water. You're aiming for 15 liters in total. Uh, and you wanna hit your pitching temperature as well. So what do I mean by that? Well, add either hot water or cold water so you get the right temperature when you hit 15 liters. If you're aiming for 30 degrees Celsius uh, and it is 20 degrees Celsius, put hot water in. If it's 36 degrees, then put cold water in. It's pretty easy really. It sounds like it'll be tricky, but it's not just uh, keep adding smaller and smaller bits of water and add less than you think until you kind of get the hang of this. Now, pitching temperature. What temperature should it be? That is going to 100% depend on your yeast. Pitching temp is just the temperature that the wash is at when you throw the yeast in. Now, I'm gonna be using a yeast called the Red Label uh, that is fine with high temperatures. 35 degrees Celsius for this stuff is absolutely nothing but you really don't have to use it. I'm kind of doing my own little side testing thing outside of this video as well. You could use baker's yeast if you wanted to, and if you're gonna use baker's yeast, I'd suggest around about 30 degrees Celsius for pitching temperature, uh, or BYO yeast, and just read the label, see what temperature it says. <laughs> Once you've got volume right and pitching temperature correct, you're gonna to wanna to add one good sized teaspoon of yeast nutrient as well as one half teaspoon of DAP. Uh, basically, this is just a, a nitrogen source for our yeast. 
Um, Google Dap, you'll find it at most brewing stores. Next up, it's time to put the yeast in, and I'm using one teaspoon. Like I said, uh, I'm using the temperature-resistant red label yeast. Uh, if you're interested in it and you're in New Zealand, you can get it from our store. There'll be a link in the description down below. Americans, I know, you keep asking. We'll see what we can do about it, all right? I'll, I'll, we're working on it. Now it's time to let the wash ferment. It is ideally worth trying to keep the temperature of the wash relatively stable throughout the fermentation uh, and as close to the temp range that your yeast likes. Uh, if your yeast has a dirty great big range of, you know, like 15 to 40 written on the box, generally aim for the middle. Uh, and it doesn't matter too much if you're on one side or the other of that. It's, it, it's more important to try and have it even. So don't stress if you don't have an STC 1000 or one of these controller boxes that look after the temperature of the yeast for you. It's nice to have, it's not 100% necessary. It is, however, better to take your wash and you know wrap it in some blankets at the very least if it's out in the shed. Or take it out of the shed and put it in the hot water cupboard and try not to get in trouble for it. Uh, because, you know, 35 degrees Celsius during the day and five degrees Celsius at night, cycling back and forth isn't the best thing for it. How do you know when it's finished? All of that stuff stops. <laughs> so if you have an airlock, the airlock bubbling will most likely stop. Uh, the, the, like the churning and the boiling sort of action that you see, especially if you've got a glass carboy, that'll stop. And the fizzing on top will slowly stop as well. I would suggest you wait until that point and then wait another two, three days. But ideally what you'll do uh, is test with a hydrometer. A hydrometer is a little piece of equipment that tests the density of liquid compared to water. Why is that interesting to us? Because it pretty much tells us how much sugar is left in there. So if you get down to a density of around about one, or even potentially slightly lower, you know you're done and you're good to go. So it's time to get on to distillation and introduce to you that special equipment that I was telling you about and the sponsor of today's episode. This is the brand new Air Still Pro by Still Spirits. And Still Spirits are sponsoring this video. This is not a review. It's a product spotlight. You can't buy a product review on the Stillit channel, uh, but you can get a product spotlight, which essentially means I'm gonna use this product because it's gonna do the job we need it to do in teaching you how to make a gin. And along the way, I am gonna point out some of the features of this new product, which is, I gotta admit, kind of interesting. Let's fire the thing up and perform our first lot of stripping runs. Well, what is a stripping run, you ask? Well, it's the first of two sets of distillations we're going to do. A stripping run is essentially cutting down the volume in the fermenter and raising the ABV by removing mostly water from what we're uh, gonna carry on using later on. So we're gonna take wash from the fermenter and pop it into the Air Still Pro. Generally, I do this just with a pot. I actually filled up both the Air Still Pro and the Air Still uh, because, well, I mean, honestly, these are kind of small stills, so doubling up and uh, cutting the stripping run time in half is fine by me, uh, and I'm a, you know, a spoiled YouTuber, so I've got both. Uh, but I also wanted to show you some of the differences between the two. So when we turn the, where is the, where have I put it? Oh my word. Uh, the air still on, the fans spin up, uh, which is actually kind of a good thing because there's no way to tell uh, whether or not there's power going to the pot itself other than the fan spinning. With the air still pro, however, we press it to make sure it's in standby. We get the white light and we hold it down. Oh, it's running. And listen, listen, listen. The fan turns itself off uh, until it's actually needed, which is genius because over here, still humming away. And uh, we have a little indication light down on the pot uh, to let us know that yes, this is in fact on. Love it. None of this stuff is groundbreaking, but it is, you know, nice little quality of life stuff. We uh, have a little heat up time here, so I'll come back to you when the stills are running. All right, we are now into our stripping run. Uh, so I'm not worried at all about making cuts. I'm not worried uh, about the speed these stills are running at. All I'm worried about is making sure that uh, we're getting this done as quick as possible, purely just for time's sake, uh, and making sure that the condensers are not being overpowered. There's not vapor coming out. 
Uh, with these stills, these two stills, I don't have any choice in the matter. They're just going to run at the speed they run at. Uh, but if I was, you know, using one of my bigger stills, my keg still, my 50 liter Dr. Gratis, uh, the um, T500 pot with the Alembic dome on top, uh, I would run it as fast as I could without steam coming out the end. So essentially as fast as your condenser will allow you to run. And I'm going to run quite deep into the quote unquote tails, even though we're not separating them, uh, simply because I worked hard to make this vodka and I want to keep as much of it as I can. So I'm not worried about ABV now. I just want to get the good stuff into the pot with as little water as possible. So we are down to 10% off the spout on the Airstill Pro uh, and 27% coming off the spout on the Airstill. This one was uh, about 15 minutes behind, 20 minutes behind in terms of uh, when it actually got started up. So I'm not too worried about that. So I'm gonna stop this one now at 10%. 10% is kind of like a nice goal to get to for a stripping run um, for a vodka in my mind. The plan is essentially to just keep doing this, uh, do a stripping run, empty the still out, fill it up again until your ferment is empty. And then you'll have the low wines, which is the stuff in here, which we can turn into vodka in the next step. A quick note to say that another advantage of this kind of recipe is that you don't need to worry about the wash being super clear when you distill it, especially for a stripping run. Uh, and to be honest, these little stills, if you're using the air still, either of them, uh, they can actually even handle a wee bit of chunky stuff. If you're using a different kind of still design, I would suggest that you make sure to filter out anything that's actually chunky. Our stripping runs are done and all of the liquid, all of the spirit that we collected from that first uh, batch of stripping runs. So the accumulation of all the liquid from all the stripping runs, <laughs> in my case, uh, it was two in the Airstill Pro and two in the Airstill, are uh, collected here. Uh, and we're gonna call this low wines. So this is uh, not a finished product. Any value between like 20% ABV and 35% percent ABV is about on the money. The only consideration to make is that um, if it's over 40% ABV, you want to proof it back down just with water to below 40% ABV. Anyway, now we have the low wines, it is time to make our spirit run. Now to do this, we're going to use a different kind of distillation, which is reflux distillation. Here is the T500, uh, a very common, let me move that over, uh, reflux head. You can buy these things just about anywhere, including our website if you're in New Zealand. Uh, but the idea with a reflux still, the only difference is that as the vapour comes up through the column, you have a means, some means of cooling some of that vapour and sending it back down the column. The interaction of vapour coming up and liquid going down uh, essentially means that you're getting more distillations than just the one that we had going on with the pot stills beforehand. What does that mean for us? It means that the percentage ABV coming off uh, the spout that you're actually collecting goes way up. So if we just redistilled what I have here now uh, in a pot still, and we took all of the product we kept and averaged it out, you know, in terms of ABV, uh, 70, 75% ABV for a vodka, we want that number to be way higher. That's where we need a reflux still. Whoop. Now, I'm gonna be using the Air Still Pro because it actually does reflux as well. Let me get it set up, let me get it started, and then I'll explain to you, you know, what you could do if you're gonna use different equipment. All right, here we go. Low winds go in. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Still head goes on, so you can see it. Get it all plugged in. And with this little guy, what we need to do actually is switch this little nozzle out. So they have two different nozzles, one for pot still mode and another for reflux mode. There is a spanner in the little bag that it comes in. I've been assured that the only reason the spanner is there uh, is, you know, um, with it heating up and cooling down, it might get stuck. So we don't use the spanner to put this in. We only use it to take it out if we need it. Go on, there we go. We're just going to do that finger tight. And because I'm crap at things like this, I'm going to put these back in the bag and put it on my bench right behind me. Otherwise, I will lose it. Power on, press the button. We're green, we're in reflux mode. And we have to make sure that our four shots collection jigger is in the right spot as well. All right, this is going to take a while to heat up. 
So what if you're operating on a larger scale? Uh, you might be using something like a milk can like this one from Claw Hammer or the T500 uh, boiler. Both of these are good options. Or of course, maybe you've got like a 50 liter keg still or uh, something like the 50 liter uh, Dr. Gratis sort of setup I've got over there. All of that is fine. The only difference up to this point is that you would have scaled your wash and your stripping runs up to meet the, uh, the volume of the still that you're gonna be filling. So once again, just to recap, the easy way to think about this is to uh, do three to four, probably four times the volume of your reflux still size that you wanna run in wash, uh, and then strip all of that out, and then you'll be about the right, uh, the right volume. So the fan has just turned on, which means we're getting pretty damn close, and yep, there we go. Uh, you can see that the automatic uh, four shots collection is working. You can do it pretty easily yourself though. Uh, the idea is that you just wanna throw away the first little bit of the distillate it's not gonna taste great, and it's definitely not gonna leave you feeling good the next day, uh, so ditch it. In my mind, it doesn't really matter exactly how much four shots you take, because we're still gonna collect heads uh, and separate those anyway. I like to be pretty ruthless with my cuts to you know, have a really nice uh, tasting product at the end, and if we're removing the heads anyway, you know, what does it matter if the extra or too little or too much by 10 mils goes into heads or goes into four shots? Makes no difference either way. Let's break this whole cuts, four shots, heads, hearts, tails thing down a little bit more, shall we? Uh, the way to think about this is imagine uh, the beginning of the run and the end of the run. And between those two points, we're gonna get a few different things and we're gonna divide it up differently. So at the very beginning, we kind of take a very small amount of four shots. Like I said, we don't want it, we're gonna ditch it, we're gonna throw it away. The next part, right after four shots is heads. And that's gonna be a larger chunk of the, uh, the overall products that you collect. And it's no longer as nasty as four shots, but it's pretty damn nasty still. To be honest, when you're doing a reflux run like this, you may not even wanna differentiate between four shots and heads. The reason home distillers differentiate between the four shots and the heads is because quite often you can reuse these in something later on. In reflux distillation, it makes less sense because the still is doing a better job of separating everything out. Anyway, so the heads are going to taste and smell uh, like nail polish remover. They're going to be very brash, very harsh, um, tingly, spiky in the mouth. They're going to smell very, very volatile. Uh, they can taste kind of like, um, almost like potpourri, sort of fake sweet, fake fruit. Uh, smells that can sometimes smell kind of attractive, uh, but if you taste it, it's gonna be really harsh. So let me have a little, a little smell first. Um, get a little bit on your finger, give it a little bit of a rub to sort of get it all evaporating all over your skin, and then give it a smell. Quite often to me, heads, uh, especially on a run like this where we're creating quite a clean vodka, they're gonna smell slightly sweet. Slightly sweet, but just a little bit kind of like cleaning product. I wouldn't taste it yet, I would wait a little bit longer. Now, after we get past the uh, heads, we're gonna get into hearts. And this is the chunk that we want to keep. It is the stuff that is gonna turn into our final product. But don't get too relaxed because down near the end, we're gonna hit tails. Uh, and tails are gonna be bad as well. We can talk about that later on. But first, right now, we need to focus on figuring out where we're switching from heads to hearts. There's different ways to go about making these cuts, and I've got a whole lot of videos about that. I'll link them in the description down below. The first way is to collect multiple different jars uh, and then keep them all in the order that you took them off the still. And the reason you do that is because you can go back and visit them. You can sort of like smell this one and smell this one. Say, this sort of smelt clean, but now that I smell this, this is really clean. No, this is no good. That's kind of the idea. And it means that you're in no rush. You don't have to make any decisions in real time based on what the still's doing. You can just keep on collecting them and come back the next day if you're tired and your palate's blowing out and you can't smell anything anymore. Cover them up, come back the next day and make the decision then. The other way to do it is as the still's running, you just keep on smelling it and sniffing it, start tasting it and make your decisions that way. And of course, you can do everything in between. I quite often do rolling cuts, which is uh, I'll have three or four jars and just sort of switch those out. So I've got three or four jars worth of the past <laughs> to compare with. 
I think that's what I'm going to do today. So uh, I need some more cups. All right, I've got more glasses. Uh, let me assess this again. I'm gonna have a little taste now. Yeah, this is starting to change. So uh, what I'm actually gonna do is switch over to these smaller glasses uh, because, uh, I, I mean, let's face it, with a run the size, it doesn't really matter. But uh, the smaller glasses are nice when you're thinking about the sort of transition points. So what's changed here is that it's no longer so just pure cleaning product uh, and sweet smelling. It is that sort of sweet, almost baby sick sort of smell has faded away. Now it's just, it, it smells like almost nothing, to be honest. But when you taste it, a little bit bitter, a little bit astringent. Okay, yep, so the bitterness and the uh, astringency are starting to fade. We're getting pretty close to switching over to hearts, I believe, which is interesting. We haven't taken a lot. Small run. Remember that, Jesse. I'm used to doing like 50 litre batches of this stuff. <laughs> All right, let's check ABV. We are at 89%. So that's actually kind of respectable, considering, I mean, dude, look at the size of the column we've got in here. Like I said before, the size of the column is purity, like the higher the ABV you can get. Um, it's a cool new product, but it's not magic. <laughs> you know, it's not gonna do anything crazy. And the low ones that we put in there weren't super high ABV either. So if you push that up higher, uh, you'd be getting a slightly higher ABV now as well. We're getting very close to switching. In fact, I'm gonna, so this is what I meant by rolling cuts, right? So these are the, the nasty heads, so I can get that out of the way now. Uh, these are the kind of like borderline in-betweens, and I'm thinking, yeah, we're getting pretty close. So we started with that just like cleaning product, like sweet, almost like, weird sick sweet smell uh, through to the sweetness sort of cleaning out but it getting kind of astringent and bitter. And now the, the bitterness and the astringency is starting to clean up as well. I don't think we're quite there yet. All right, we're on to jar number four. Well, five if you count the um, four shots in here. And this is why rolling cuts is really good because I actually thought here that this was gonna be hearts, um, but I'm gonna push it, and I think maybe this is gonna be hearts now. Uh, and why do I call it rolling cuts? Well, we know that this and this is definitely not hearts, right? So I'm gonna take these and go and pop them in, uh, in a keg I've got over there, which I use to hold feints, which is basically uh, heads and tails all smushed together in case I wanna do something different with them later on. Uh, and because this is only distilling, you know, it's not full reflux, there's definitely good stuff in here uh, that I can reuse again. I'll keep it. Apologies, my camera overheated. Thanks for that, Canon. Uh, but I'm back now. Uh, you haven't really missed anything because we're still collecting hearts uh, and it hasn't really changed at all since about three quarts of the way through uh, this jar here. So once again, rolling cuts. Uh, I now know that this I'm definitely not gonna use, so that can go into the faints as well. This I can now taste. There's a difference, it's not huge, uh, but it is, I think, worth making the differentiation. So that is gonna be faints as well. Now, like I said, you don't have to do this now. You can line all the glasses up and do it at the end. That's entirely up to you. Another little tip is, I'm, I, <laughs> This is gonna sound macho and, and wanky and that is not what it's supposed to be at all. I've just been tasting a lot of high ABV spirits for a long time. It sounds like it wouldn't happen, but I kinda know my limit about what I can and can't taste and I'm happy tasting this at higher ABV and not wrecking my palate. If you're new to this game, that's not gonna be the case, <laughs> okay? <laughs> what I would suggest you doing is uh, taking a teaspoon getting about half a teaspoon worth of spirit in there and then another half teaspoon of water and taste it that way. That'll preserve your palate for a lot longer. Anyway, uh, there's nothing really to do at the moment other than just ride this out and uh, I'll let you know when the tails start showing up. Cuts haven't changed, but I did collect a small sample off the still just now. Uh, and put it into the easy dents again, and check it out. 
we're still at 89.6%. Uh, so once I've run this enough times uh, to really understand it, I will do a full review that uh, Steel Spirits has no sway over. They won't get to see it or anything. So keep your eye open for that. Anyway, I guess we just keep on trucking until we look like we're starting to head into tails. I'll see you then. <laughs> Objectively, when you're making vodka, you'd rather this be up, you know, pushing azeotrope around 95% ABV. But uh, 89 is not horrible. Getting to 91, 92% is not too difficult with a, a like a proper reflux still. Uh, 92 to 93% gets a little bit more tricky. Like you'd have to run a T500 properly to do that and kind of tweak it a little bit. Uh, and then getting from that 93% up to 95% is, um, that's an achievement. Like actually hitting azeotrope is pretty impressive. What does it mean in terms of actual difference in flavor? I mean, it's relative, right? Like a lot of people will taste this and taste something that was distilled to 95% and say it's the same. Uh, some people will say they're worlds apart. Uh, the skill of the distiller comes in a lot. Like if you screw your cuts up, it doesn't really matter what percent you're distilling to it's all all the stuff's going in there anyway so I mean it's all relative can we get a solid result like this a hundred percent this is pretty damn clean and the reason that we picked the recipe we picked at the beginning of this remember is because it's going to aid us it's going to make things a little softer a little smoother because of the oats uh, and some of the flavor that's coming through is going to be interesting grainy flavor rather than you know just sugar bowl or weird nutrient flavors or any of that sort of stuff uh, so we are 100% on track to make a solid gin still right now. Uh, what generally happens with reflux is that you will suddenly, like very quickly change from it's fine to I think maybe there's a little bit of tails to holy crap that's all tails. <laughs> I find it really hard to describe the tails. To me it's like wet cement uh, or cement powder. It's not acrid, it's not bitter, it's not astringent, it's not spicy, it's not peppery, but somehow it's somewhere in between all of those things, all, all related to each other. You know that that feeling of cement powder in your nose or smelling wet cement and it kind of feels like it's attacking you? That's the, um, the taste, the smell. Oh yeah, 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 okay, it's coming in now, definitely. So I think, let's try this again. Still not sure about that. I'm going to sit on that for a little bit, uh, but I'm almost positive that I'm going to call this uh, this tails here now. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to keep that, but I'll sit on it for a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so this is this is now tails. I'm not going to keep any more of that. Uh, now it's up to you. You could run this out more uh, and collect more of the tails to put into your fates jar and potentially reuse later on. Uh, but I'll be honest with you guys. I got a buttload of faints, I don't need it. What I don't have a buttload of is time. <laughs> Speaking of time, uh, it is 6.15 and I put this on at uh, right on 12 o'clock. So this took uh, just over six hours. Now what I wanna do is get this proofed back down. Uh, I would like to start maceration at 50% ABV. Uh, so we gotta get this down to 50%. So uh, what I need to do is measure it uh, and then dilute it just with water. So, boop. Hey, I didn't spill any. Are you proud of me? I'm proud of me. <laughs> and number two. All right, so we have a little bit less than I thought. I guess these are 500 mils up to the top, uh, but that is uh, 800 mils at 89% ABV. Uh, let's get this proof down. Uh, the easiest way I've found to do this is uh, to use a calculator. Uh, I've just pulled a random one up here. The one on Chase the Craft still hasn't been finished and put up. We're having a little bit of trouble with it. I'm working on it, I promise you, it will come back. <laughs> In fact, as soon as I finish recording this, I'm gonna go and uh, send some emails about that. But anyway, so I need 690 mils of water. Uh, and if you're a little bit unsure, what I would suggest is uh, running the calculator and then putting in, you know, about three quarts 
of the water uh, because you can always add a little bit more in, you can't take it out without redistilling. So, you know, seems like smart advice, right? Of course, I'm being a little bit of a privileged YouTuber <laughs> using the, the Easy Dents. So we're at 55.7% ABV. So we're pretty much on track. I'm just gonna dump the rest of that in. Confident that'll be close enough. Um, you know, but you don't need to use this. You can use the uh, ABV refractometers. I have one here, which I just broke. Not great. Uh, or of course, just an alchemeter in a test jar works wonderfully as well. If you've made it this far into the video, and especially if you followed along and you're doing this yourself, congratulations, you have officially made vodka. And if you followed all the steps along in this process, you've probably made a pretty decent quality vodka. And at this point in time, let me have a little taste. There is a, a, a silky smoothness from the oats, and there's that weird kind of wheaty, licorice -y bite coming through as well. I don't know about you, it's entirely up to personal preferences, but I really like this, I think this is good. Uh, so the hard work, in my opinion, is done now. Congratulations, nice work. Welcome to the craft if it's your first time. Uh, but now we get to play and we get to actually make the gin. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up uh, the Airstill Pro and the standard Airstill and make two different recipes here. Uh, the idea is over here I'm gonna make my base recipe, the, the standard gin that I think should probably be your first go-to in terms of gin. Not because it's amazing in and of itself, but because it's a good, good platform to move on from. On this side, however, I don't know what I'm gonna make. Erin, <laughs> don't look at me like that. Erin's uh, in the process of dispatching some of her books. Woohoo, look at those, Monarch Monarchs of Aotearoa, very cool. There'll be a link down there for it if you're interested. Uh, but Erin, uh, give me a weird or different ingredient for gin that you want me to try. The seaweed one. Oh okay. yeah, you've been going on about this for ages. I don't know if that's weird. I want the seaweed All right, one. seaweed, fine. <laughs> All right, seaweed. Apparently we're doing seaweed. Thank you for that, Erin. <laughs> Throw a spanner in the works. Uh, but uh, the plan now is I'm just gonna split this batch. So 700 mils into each. So uh, if, I'm sure you're gonna start asking the questions, you know, like what if I wanna make a bigger batch? As long as you're keeping things relatively the same size, you know, and like even probably five Xing the size of the recipe I'm making, it's gonna scale relatively linearly. So these are gonna make about one bottle each, about one 700 ml bottle, honestly probably slightly less depending on what we proof it down to. Uh, if you wanna scale that up and make like five bottles, you're probably pretty, pretty good just to multiply everything by five and there will be full recipes for everything in this video down below. It's time to get the botanicals, the uh, exciting things into the mix here. And I'm gonna focus on the base recipe first. Just to give you some background, I designed this recipe to do two, well, actually three things for people that are getting into making gin. Number one, I wanted it to be simple enough to just be kind of carefree and get stuck in. Uh, but number two, it needed to cover off all of the bases that I think gin is supposed to be. Uh, and number three, it was supposed to be a springboard for people to try the base recipe, taste it, and then adjust or add to or do something crazy from it. But if you're not quite sure how to start with a recipe, this is where you start from and you add to it or take away from it or whatever. Cool? Oh, and actually one last thing. It's meant to be packed with flavor to the point where there's almost too much. It's like riding on the edge of it. Uh, but the reason for that is, is if you're a new distiller, I, I think if you're doing this the first time around and you make a gin, and it comes off and it just kind of tastes a little bit like nothing, that's really disappointing. If on the other hand, it's too full of flavor and it goes cloudy when you proof it down because there's so much flavor packed into it, that's an easy fix. You can just pour a little bit of extra vodka into it and you're golden. And to me, that guarantees success, whatever your success is, it, like however you define success for your gin more often than doing it the other way. Anyway. Here are the botanicals. We're starting with 15 grams of juniper, uncrushed, and 15 grams of crushed juniper. I think crushed juniper tends to give more of that piney, uh, resiny, Christmas tree kind of flavor. And the uncrushed juniper gives a little bit more of the berryish, 
side of things. So once again, I'm splitting it down the middle so you can alter. If you don't know, juniper is the backbone of gin. Like full stop, hands down, that's what gin is built on. Uh, next up, coriander, also really important. Uh, and I'm using eight grams of the stuff. Uh, and I give it just a light cracking. You, you don't want to pulverize it, you don't want to turn it into powder, but you kind of want to pop the seeds open. Next up, angelica root. Uh, this adds the earthy, like almost powdery uh, undertones to a gin. And often, I think that just enough angelica root to almost know it's not there, ties everything together. If you want to bump it up a little bit more and sort of push it towards being grungy and heavy and earthy, by all means, I think, for my tastes, this is balanced nicely. And lastly, uh, you've got to have some citrus in there, right? Got to have some citrus. Uh, and we're keeping this real basic with eight grams of, uh, uh, why can't I think, lemon. Dear Lord, Jesse. It's lucky you don't have to talk for a living. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is going to go into the Airstill Pro unit. Uh, and by the way, guys, you can actually, if you want to, if you already have a Airstill, you can just buy the head unit and it will work with the standard, the, the old, the, the original air still. Anyway, I'm going to put everything into here uh, and what I would normally do is put all of it in, but I'm going to switch things up just a little bit and I am going to try saving the lemon and um, putting it in the vapor path because I've been wanting to try that for a little while. Anyway, make sure all of this goes in here. All right, now at this point you've got two options. One is to just macerate it for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and if you were gonna do that, to be honest, you probably wouldn't put it into the still. You could, slap the, slap the lid on. Uh, you could just put it into a jar, into a bottle, whatever you've got handy, not a problem. The second option is to do what I'm going to do now, which I think gives a very similar result uh, with a lot less time, which is, I'm gonna heat this up to uh, 50 degrees Celsius. I'm gonna pop the lid on it and I'm gonna let it sit for one hour. Make sure, make sure you're watching it because this heats up a lot quicker than you think it does with only 700 mils in there, okay? Don't walk away, you'll be disappointed. <laughs> All right, we'll plug that in. Uh, and while this is warming up, let's make sure, yes, the little red light is on. So it is in fact working. Um, while this is warming up, I am going to do two things. One, I'm gonna make sure that I have my thermometer here, which I don't, hold on. Yes, yes I do. <laughs> I'm not a complete imbecile. And uh, I also want to get the botanicals sorted for the, uh, the funky seaweed gin for Erin. So here's the deal guys. The reason I'm doing two is to show you that you can take this base recipe and tweak it. Uh, I've dialed the juniper down slightly and I've taken it away from the piney side, slightly back towards the berry side. Still 15 grams of uh, the uncrushed juniper, but I've taken the crushed juniper back down to nine grams. We still have eight grams of coriander. I've bumped the angelica root up ever so slightly to one gram. Uh, I'm trying to push this towards kind of a, I'm gonna going for a, an interesting sweet and umami mix. That's what I'm after here. Uh, for the citrus, we've gone with five grams of lemon down from eight and I've subbed out three of those grams to orange just to mix it up a little bit. And of course, the star of the show, the seaweed, uh, I'm just going to use the good old fashioned uh, toasted seaweed for sushi action. Uh, but there's a lot, a lot of native or uh, endemic seaweed around New Zealand. So if this has some legs to it, I'd love to sub it out for that later on. I'm just gonna pop all of this straight on into the still. I have one more ingredient to get. Uh, I'm not gonna put anything in the vapor path for this one. Get in there. Don't make a mess. This is bitter orange powder. And hold on, let me take my own advice here. Yep, 50 degrees Celsius. There you go. And let's get the still head on there just to keep everything all the vapor in there, we don't want to lose that. Uh, power is off, we're good. Double check the power. All right, uh, bit of orange powder. I used this when I was uh, trying to clone Quantro. That worked pretty well actually. Uh, there's a link in the description down below if you're interested in watching that video. Uh, but this stuff was really interesting. It gave more of that marmalade orange flavor rather than like the juicy, full, like chunky orange juice flavor rather than 
uh, just orange peel, you know, like orange zest. So I'm gonna use a half teaspoon of that as well. That was a heaped half teaspoon actually. That seaweed is gonna give perhaps a slightly salty but mostly umami kind of kick to the gin. That's what I'm hoping for. Here's where my weird thought train came from this. My mum does this thing called marmalite. Toast, butter, marmite, and then marmalade on top. So it's sweet, it's salty, it's umami, it's kind of like bitter and tangy. And I thought that kind of flavor combination could be quite interesting for gin. Here we are. It might be a train wreck, I don't know. <laughs> Maceration is complete, that's been one hour. And like I said, uh, I held back the lemon. I actually needed to go and peel some more because I got kind of sad sitting here for an hour. <laughs> Um, but uh, I'm going to put that into the vapor path. The Estill Pro has a little um, gin basket thingy on top. Uh, I haven't really tried doing it like this before, so even though this is the quote-unquote base recipe, I'm doing a little bit of an experimentation over here as well. Uh, let's get both this and the other Estill rocking, and we can run two gins at the same time. Pretty much good to run. I'm just going to prop these glasses up so they don't splatter all over the place. Uh, and now we just need to wait for these to both get up to temperature. While we're doing that, I'm going to talk briefly about cuts. If you've seen me make gin before, I'm, I'm sure you've heard me say this. We've already made vodka and we've made really solid cuts on it. So that spirit is quite pure, for want of a better word. The, the cuts we made on it are good because they were compressed by the fact that we distilled it with reflux, right? We've put that vodka into the still and we're going to redistill it again. We're not just going to magically get heads all over. It's just not going to happen, right? So, uh, do we have to make cuts based on the alcohol side of things, or on the safety side of things, or on the jaggy, spiky alcohol side of things? No, not really. But it turns out that more often than not, when you're distilling botanicals like this, uh, you're going to want to take a small amount off the top anyway. Not because you need to make cuts for the alcohol, but because the botanicals just give off a weird flavor right at the beginning. How do you describe it? It's almost like bad gin essence, like all of the ginny flavors, but concentrated too much and just kind of, I don't know, like, like fake gin in some weird way. It turns out if you, if you just take a small amount for that, we're talking like maybe five to maybe 25 mils on a run this size. Oh, and look at that, right on cue. I planned it. <laughs> Let me have a taste of this. Acrid, I guess, would be the, the way I'd describe it. Uh, but it's going to clean up real quickly, I, I promise you. So let me have another taste. And it's gone. There we go. Oh, oh renegotiate. There we go. So that is all I took off. Let me measure this for you with a syringe so it can be relatively accurate. Eight and a half mils was all it took, and it changed drastically in that eight and a half mils. This bad boy was turned on about five minutes after this one, so I expect this to be up and running very soon. In fact, the, I suspect the fans will be kicking on any second now. Uh, but we're pretty much sorted for cuts. All we need to do now is ride this out uh, until one of two things happens. The ABV gets low enough that it starts just kind of diluting what we're making, um, and we decide it's not worth collecting. So normally, if I was going to call it based on that, I'd say 40, 45%. Or two, what happens more often is either you start to get a slightly odd flavor coming through from the botanicals. Uh, the flavor from the botanicals changes distinctly into something you don't like. Or all the botanical flavors just gone and you're just basically collecting alcohol at that point in time. Uh, when we get to one of those things, we will turn it off. If, however, you are new to this, and this is you know, like you've, you've run less than 10 gins before, I would 100% encourage you to stand next to the still uh, and taste it as it's coming off the spout because the flavor is going to change significantly every couple of minutes, every five minutes, every 10 minutes. Suddenly a different one of the botanicals will be prominent uh, in the spirit you're tasting. So right now, Okay, that's not bad. That's actually really nice. I'm interested to see what happens over here now. <laughs> anyway, my point being is it will continue to change. And it is an absolute education for a new distiller um, to sit there and taste. Oh, there we go. The fan's just kicked on. Uh, to sit there and taste 
as you're distilling and see how it changes. It gives you a nice understanding of the distilling process. Remember guys, the Estil Pro does the automated uh, four shots collection daily. So I'm guessing as soon as I start getting first drips out of here, we've already collected enough in the uh, little four shots jar to deal with the, the weird botanical flavors. I'll measure the volume of this when the run's done. Um, I actually haven't thought to do it yet and I'm not supposed to take this out while the still is running, apparently. We have first drips over here and let me see, how do they taste? Yes, that'll do it. All right, I'm just gonna start collecting uh, from there, which means that what I need to do now is just let this run and I will come back to you when either we uh, hit a lower ABV, a weird botanical tailsiness, or um, we just run out of flavor. I'll see you soon, guys. We're getting near the end of things, especially over on this side. Let me have one more taste. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Um. Wow, yeah, okay. I'm switching that out uh, because I don't know what the hell's happening and I don't want to drop a bunch of stuff into this that I am not into. <laughs> so kind of like the rolling cuts we talked about before. Up the top of the run, we had seaweed flavor, but it was seaweed like when you're just eating sushi and you don't actually taste the seaweed flavor. It just kind of like, it almost just sort of seasons the rice a little bit. It was lemon and that together. So that was, I was 100% on board with that. Now we're starting to get down to the more like grassy, vegetable-y, ocean-y, umami, like feels like it's gonna be salty, but it's not quite salty sort of flavors. I'm a little bit unsure about how much of that I want. Hmm. So that's why I switched over here. And my guess is that we are going to uh, run out pretty soon. That sounds like quite a grungy flavor to me that would be down the bottom. Yeah, it's fading already. Okay, I'm gonna leave that for just a second and we're gonna come and test over here. Yum. Yeah, that just tastes like the standard gin. Okay, I'm actually gonna let this run a little bit longer to see if we wanna keep that. Uh, but I think you get the idea of what I'm doing here, right? I'm just trying to decide where, where I really want to make that cut. Uh, if you're not sure, you can do the rolling cuts thing. If you're not sure, you can, you know, switch just one glass out like I have. Uh, you know, actually what I'm going to do is I'm definitely keeping all of this. So I will put that in there and just, you know, carry on collecting into the one glass. This one I don't think is too far behind. Yep, 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 yep. All right, I guess we'll just write it out. Oh, no, okay, yep, that's over. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I don't like it. That's a big old note. It's almost manure-like, like horse manure. Yeah, it's really horsey. Okay, we'll cut that off. Now this is starting to just kind of get to be a little bit bland in flavor. More of the Angelica root coming through. Most of everything else has disappeared. It's kind of like an interesting gingery thing going on with the Angelica root. So I'm gonna keep, let it keep running for a little bit uh, and we're gonna see where this goes. All right, so. We're starting to fade out a little bit to nothing here. I'm gonna make another switch. Dump that in there and decide we're keeping that. See what happens on this one. Alcohol starting to drop a lot quicker now as well. My guess is if we took an ABV on this, it's probably around the 55% now. Actually, let's do that. Oh. It's a little bit lower actually, it's 52% ABV. So, let me have one last taste. Yeah, it's just feeling empty now. Empty.
And I will keep this and ditch that. Right, we are pretty much there guys. It is time to proof down our gin. Right now, uh, this gin is setting at, I'm an idiot, I've forgotten what it's sitting at. I just took the reading. <laughs> My word, let me do that again. I think it was 75. Okay, 75.9% ABV. If you wanna drink your gin at 75.9% ABV, Groovy, uh, you are done. Personally, uh, I would like that to be 40, 45% ABV bottled. Uh, so what we need is we need the proof that the ABV is at and the volume. So I've got 400 mils at 76% ABV. I'm gonna proof this to 42% ABV, uh, and we need 320 mils of water. When you're proofing down, it is definitely worth uh, using a water that you like to drink. At the very least, if you wanna go into more geekery on the type of water you wanna proof it down for the type of spirits, then by all means, but the basic is, is as long as it's something that you're happy to drink is water, then, um, Awesome. Now, all we need to do is bottle this up. And, oh dear Lord, Jesse, you spilt it. Dang it. That would have been 750 mils, I think. Now, when you make gin and you proof it down like this, uh, it tends to get a little bit beat up. In other words, what I'm saying is it needs to sit for a little while to be all that it can be. Generally, I find that like 24 hours gives a huge improvement. Another two days after that gives a slight improvement. Uh, and then after that, the law of diminishing returns really kicks in. So if you want it to be as good as it can possibly be, leave it for like a week. Um, 24 hours is going to be most of the way there. Just letting it sit for a little bit allows everything to kind of reincorporate back into the spirit. Uh, it mellows out significantly. So if you try it now and you're like, whoa, that tastes a little bit like fire, don't freak out um, because, you know, it'll probably be fine in 24 hours. And um, I'm gonna label it as well because I get the feeling that this is definitely going to get drunk. I'm putting the label on upside down. Muffet. Nothing fancy, just the old vivid on tape. Let me get this proof down as well. I'm gonna do it exactly the same way and we can taste the stuff. And bam, just like that, well, I, I shouldn't say just like that, because let's face it, it was a bit of work, but the work was worth it. <laughs> anyway, just like that, we now have two bottles of gin sitting here, which is pretty freaking awesome. We've got the base gin on this side and the seaweed gin on this side. Uh, before I taste them, uh, I need to do two things. One, I need to say a huge thank you to the Patreons. Thank you so much, Patreons, for being the people that support me day in, day out. Uh, love your work, guys. You're kick-ass human beings, and thank you. For everyone else, uh, if you're finding value in these videos and you think I've earned it, uh, you can go on over to Patreon. There'll be a link in the description down below. Uh, and the long and short of it is that you can sign up uh, to different tiers that get different things and support us directly. Like I said, if you're finding value in these videos and you'd like to support us in what we're doing, there's a link down there. Anyway, uh, the other thing I need to do before we taste is at least admit the fact that this is not clear. It's a little cloudy. Here's what happened, guys. Whenever you proof something like a gin down, uh, you'll get to a point where the flavor compounds in the liquid are no longer soluble. And they'll just come out of solution, and then, hey presto, you've got a, a cloudy gin. If I was running a commercial distillery, I would either have to steer super freaking hard into the cloudiness and like make it our number one marketing thing, I think, or uh, it would be unacceptable. You couldn't do it. Because I'm not, and I'm just making things at home the way I like them, honestly, I don't really care. I'm gonna do nothing about it. I'm just gonna drink it like it is, and it is a, almost like a, it's almost like a weird badge of honor that, hey, look how much, look how much flavor I crammed into my gin. <laughs> you can think of it like that if you want to, but if you do wanna fix it, you know, and make it just look like the stuff on the shelf at the, at the bottle store, the easiest way to do it would be to uh, dilute this back down with more neutral, more vodka that's sitting at a higher ABV than it. So you're diluting the flavor down slightly with 
the vodka that you're adding and you're raising the ABV potentially a little bit too, you know, like maybe I'd put this much in of 55% ABV and just see what happened. I'm not gonna bother. Anyway, let's taste. I'm gonna taste the base gin first because that is what I know. Uh, and then I'm looking forward to tasting this because that's, that's different. So cheers team. Pretty much exactly as I remember this recipe, big, bold, ginny flavors. Like I said earlier on too, team, this is made to be quite like bold, heavy gin. If it's too much for you, uh, pour a little bit into a glass like this and then just pour a little bit of vodka in until it settles out at about, you know, the right punchiness for you. Uh, but anyway, big, bold juniper character. That's the number one characteristic in this thing. There's kind of the sweet berry-ish side to the juniper, but there's also the resiny, Christmas tree, almost tar-like weight to it as well. I'm getting lemon on the nose, but not a whole lot of it. I'm not getting any of the root coming through at this stage, but here we go. Hmm. Hmm. To me, that's just kind of what gin is. There's nothing amazing about it. It's just balanced uh, the way that I like it, which is a buttload of juniper <laughs> and really heavy flavors overall. The alcohol base is actually quite pleasant too. Like I'm really enjoying this recipe and I think I might use this more for gins. I'm not getting much of that licorice note in here just because there's so much freaking flavor in that. Like start to end, it's just gin. <laughs> uh, but the oats are definitely sort of giving it just a little bit of a silky velvety feel without pulling it away from being dry. This to me is what a gin should be. And it's what I think is a great base for you to start. If it's too much, you water it, or vodka it down a little bit, uh, and then you can change the recipe next time. If it is too resiny for you, you crush less of the juniper or add slightly less crushed juniper in. Uh, if it is just a little bit too mundane or uh, not complex enough for you, you could think about starting to add in some different citruses or some star anise or uh, aniseed or cinnamon or berries, or cardamom is probably the first place that you should look, uh, which is another pretty standard gin flavor. But the point is, it's there to be a base. It's there to be the bare minimum, in my eyes, that a gin can be, and still be gin. Anyway, seaweed gin. Uh, there's also the other, there's the orange, uh, and also the marmalade orange in terms of the citrus, and giving that slight kind of pithy butt candied kind of citrus flavor. Works really well on this, I like it. Now I'm not getting any straight up seaweed on the nose and I'm definitely not getting any brininess. Uh, but what I am getting is an interesting umami, like slightly savory note sitting under that, that marmalade flavor. It's working, that, I like that, that, that works well. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that drinks very differently. Okay, so the biggest thing that I noticed, compared to the, oh, that went down the wrong hole, compared to the base gin, is that the, the tarry, resiny, like, mouth-covering feeling of the juniper has been dialed back significantly. Been cut in half, I would say, <laughs> funnily enough. Uh, and that's allowing the, the citrus, marmalade-y, kind of, like, candied, orangey sort of flavors to come out. But they're being balanced with that interesting umaminess, which is a lot more present on the tongue. And it, it actually, it actually, funnily enough, is not dissimilar to the whole idea of marmalade that I was talking about, but it's more savory and marmalade rather than salty, savory marmalade. Unfortunately, I'm not getting any brininess. I would have liked a hint of that. That would have been cool. Uh, but what I am getting is this, I, I don't know how to describe it, man. It's this weird, fresh, open space kind of note that is just, I, it sounds so silly to say it, but it's kind of like ocean breeze. <laughs> you know how there's all those air freshers and stuff that always put that in the description? It's always been kind of meaningless to me, but this, this does get it. I don't know, it reminds me of being on a beach when it's all stormy and crazy but that fresh, like, you're alive <laughs> smell. I, this is probably a totally personal experience for me, so I'm just gonna stop talking about it, but there you have it. 
So this is pretty much what I have come to believe it is gonna be. It's a base for you to launch from. The bare minimum a gin can be in terms of complexity in my mind and still be a gin. I think you need those kind of components. You need juniper, you need citrus, um, coriander, yeah, 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 I think you kind of need it, and some form of root, I think you need that as well. It is dialed way up in terms of the intensity of the flavor, but it's like that so you can easily, you know, proof it back down with vodka if you want to, or dilute it, I should say. It's there for you to try as your first gin and use as a springboard. And I hope doing this kind of illustrated how that worked, right? We kind of took this recipe and then messed with it a little bit and added some more flavors in to get this. So I genuinely hope that watching through this video has made you realize that yes, making gin is a bit of work, but it is 100% worth it and it can be super, super rewarding uh, and it just opens up a whole world of complexity in terms of different flavors that you can dip into and change and adjust. This is your springboard. Please, please, please take it, mess with it, and go and make something crazy with it. Put weird ingredients in it, dial in your exact flavors by switching ingredients up or changing the amounts that you put in. Uh, and if you do, come back and stick a comment in the comment section down below here uh, so everyone else can get inspired by your ideas. And also, honestly, it just kind of makes me happy to see people doing that. So. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up, drop a comment in the comment section down below. If you found it really valuable, uh, please consider signing up on Patreon. Uh, but whether you do or don't, it doesn't really matter because I will see you next week. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya.